I'm going to share a little bit about the, our compassionate Father, Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. What a wonderful declaration, what a wonderful attitude of heart to be concerned about blessing God and pleasing God. So often we're concerned about Him blessing us. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works I will meditate. That's uh, such a um, wonderful, um, beneficial aspect of living is to take the time to meditate on the God that we worship and that we love. Psalms like this that talk about Him, if you sit and you meditate on it, by meditate I don't mean, what I mean is you focus on one thing, you know, and one thing only and keep focusing on that until God illumines you and works with you. Um, And it is such a great blessing to meditate upon our God on His wonderful works. Verse 6, Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. What a wonderful, wonderful God we have. What a, what a, such a glorious description of the God that we love. How could we not love someone who is so gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness? This is the God we worship. The Lord is good to all, and His mercies are over all His works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your, in, your dominion endures throughout all generation. The Lord sustains all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear Him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps... All who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My, by my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's look at Psalm 103. It talks about God's great goodness, our meditating upon him, and asking him to help us, because he is a gracious God and a compassionate God. Psalm 103 is a favorite. Again, it starts by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. And in verse 22, 21, 20, Bless the Lord, verse 21, Bless the Lord, verse 22, Bless the Lord. It begins by blessing the Lord, and it ends by blessing the Lord, this beautiful psalm. Let's go back to verse 1. Bless the Lord. And when the word Lord, L-O-R-D, is in capital letters, it's talking about Yahweh, God's proper name. So it is, bless Yahweh, that's this up here. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget none of His benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, 
who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion and who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. Verse 8, Yahweh is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. But as high as the heaven is above the earth, and how high is the heaven above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he renewed, removed our transgressions from us. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. We forget from time to time who we are and what we're made out of, but he doesn't. He knows that we came from dust. He knows the needs of our lives. He knows the inner workings of our soul. And he's compassionate towards us. For as as man, his days are as the grass, a flower of the field, so he flourishes. And when the wind passes over it, it is no more. Verse 17, But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. And his righteousness to the children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. The word compassion and the word mercy are are often used interchangeably in both the Old and the New Testament. There's one particular Hebrew word that is translated both ways. And then there's a Greek word that is translated both ways in the New Testament. There are other words that are used for mercy, but the one that is translated compassion is the one that I'm referring to now. The word compassion and and mercy means to have a sympathetic consciousness of the distresses of someone else along with the desire to alleviate it. Now, that's an important concept for you to grab hold of this morning. That's what, we're, that's what I'm focusing on. I have just read two psalms to you, both of which spoke about these things. It's a sympathetic consciousness of the distresses that another person has along with the desire to alleviate it. God is compassionate, sympathetic. He feels what you feel. He understands you. He has compassion for you. That's what it means. He he knows what's going on in your heart, in your life, in your mind. He knows what's going on. And He feels for you. He has sympathetic consciousness of you and of your distresses and a desire to eliminate it. I walked into the room, the apartment with... um, one of the believers who asked me to go with him to meet this woman who was in tremendous distress. I went up to her. She didn't know me. I didn't know her. But right away, my heart was overwhelmed with compassion for her because I knew what had happened in her life. I embraced her, and she started crying to me. And then she, she pointed to the middle of the room where there was a chair. And this it was a wooden chair, and uh, an old wooden chair. And I could see the scratch marks on it. And she said to me, that's where he did it. That's where he hung himself. And the scratch marks on the chair were his endeavor to get back on the chair once he knocked himself off from hanging himself. He left a note. She showed me the note. The note said, nobody loves me and nobody understands me. And I want to end my life. Nobody loves me. And nobody understands me. He was wrong. He was wrong. I don't know how much, how many humans loved him or how many humans understood him. But I know that Almighty God loved him. 
And I know that Almighty God understood him. But he didn't know that. Really a tragic, tragic reality. There are many people that live today that have that same kind of tormenting pain in their soul where they feel that nobody understands them, that nobody really loves them, that nobody really cares for them. And they they walk around with this heavy burden of loneliness and distress. And yet, the verses of Scripture that I just read to you are, are, are true. Those feelings are not necessarily true. They're not true. Because there is a God, the Creator of all, the Heavenly Father, who knows each and every one of us intimately and has compassion for all of us, individually and collectively. He has a sympathetic consciousness of of you and the distresses that you bear and a desire to alleviate them. Whether or not he's able to do that is dependent upon you and allowing him into your heart and your life to work with you. Look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 1 says, O Yahweh, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down. And are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Yahweh, you knew it all. You have enclosed behind me and before me. You go before me and behind me. And lay your hand upon me. Oh, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. How can I attain to it? Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my abode in Shalol, in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, Even darkness is not dark to you. Night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Darkness does not deter our God from seeing. All the lies and the deceptions and all the the facades do not hinder him at all from seeing the truth. I was talking with Frank and Dina the other day about someone that they loved and I loved and about how at different points in our lives, you know, that we have uh, as children, our parents know as well as we grow up and we move out of our parents' house, they, they aren't as connected with us. If we marry at that time, we have a spouse, maybe our spouse knows as well. If we have children, then our children know us as parents. As we go on in life, we have friends that know a certain aspect of us, and we have fellow employees that may know a certain aspect of us. We have students that we go to school with. Everybody knows a little bit about you. And you change. But nobody knows all about you. No one knows you from the first day that you take your breath to the last day that you take your breath. Nobody save for Almighty God. And so often... You know, even the people that we are most connected with right now don't know what's going on in our hearts. We all have a secret side to our life. We don't blab out everything that's going on. We're afraid that nobody will want to be with us if we say everything, right? (laughs) So the point, my point is, is that really nobody, nobody knows you inside and out. Save one, the Lord God. 
And here's the good news. He has compassion on you. Not only does he see the darkness does not deter him, the lies do not deceive him, he sees clearly, consistently, and he knows what's in your heart. And he has the desire to alleviate it. This is our God. And the good news about our God is he's our father too. He has a fatherly concern about us. <laughs> We're in pretty good shape when you think about it that way. It's much better than trying to kill yourself. Because that, that's not the answer. The answer is found in God. In allowing him into your life. Where do we stop in Psalm 139? Let's pick up on 13. For... for You formed my inner parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. (laughs) What? (laughs) When you were dust, before you were, before you were, well, you get the point. Before you were, he knew. I don't, you know, that's a little bit beyond my comprehension. And in the book were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. Oh, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. (laughs) Isaiah, please go turn to the book of Isaiah. You've got Psalms, Proverbs, that way. Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30, verse 11. Israel wasn't doing real well at this point. It says in Isaiah 30, verse 11, Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path, 3011. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. That's what they were saying. That's not good. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, since you have rejected this word, the word that the prophet was speaking to him, and have put your trust in oppression and guile, and have relied on them, therefore, this iniquity will be to you like a breach about to fall, like a bulge in the high wall, whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant, whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar, so ruthlessly shattered that a shred will not be found among its pieces to take fire from the hearth or to scoop water from the cistern, something that they would do with a broken pot would be to carry the coals on, you know, the broken pottery or carry water. But this pottery is going to be so scattered or so broken apart, it won't be useful for anything. He's talking about the nation of Israel because rather than going to Yahweh, they're going to pagan nations to help them to fend against the enemy that is about to attack them. For thus saith, verse 15, the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, in repentance and rest... You will be saved. In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. In quietness and trust. Meditate upon Yahweh. But you were not willing. Verse 16. You said, no, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand will flee at the threat of one man. You will flee at the threat of five until you are left as a flag on the mountaintop, as a signal on the hill. Verse 18. Therefore, the Lord, Yahweh, longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For Yahweh is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for Him. You're going about doing it your own way. It's not going to work. 
You're going to be worse than a pot that shatters a pot. And here, Yahweh longs to be gracious to you. He waits on high to have compassion on you. But he is a God of justice. He will not break his own laws. He's not going to make you want him. He's not going to make you come to him and seek him and desire him. He's not going to make you be quiet in his presence and accept his goodness. Because he is a God of justice. And then it it says, how blessed are all those who long for him. What a wonderful, wonderful thought that our God longs to be gracious to us. He has a passion and a great desire to be gracious to us. He waits on high to have compassion on us. But we have to allow him into our lives. We have to, I, I think, I thought of this and I, I it's just surrender. And I, I don't mean praising Jesus like surrender. I mean like Lift your hands up and give up. Surrender. That's what I mean. (laughs) Give up. I can't do it on my own. I surrender. God help me. And the great news is, He has compassion. He knows you inside. He knows you better than you know you. You blow your mind half the time. I can't believe I just did that. (laughs) I can't believe I said that. God's over there. Well, I'm not surprised. (laughs) Do you think you could find Micah in the Old Testament? Going back towards the New Testament, Micah chapter 7. It's after Jonah, which is after Amos, which is... I, I found it quite quickly because I knew the teaching and I put my ribbon there. Micah chapter 5. Chapter 7. If we all had the same Bibles, I'd tell you the number, but the page number, but we don't. Micah 7, yeah. If you can't find it, that's all right. Act like you're there. and I'll... <laughs> Micah 7, 5. Do not trust in a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. <laughs> From her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. For sons treats fathers contemptuously. Daughter rises against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies are the men of his own household. Remember that quote from the New Testament. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, Yahweh is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of Yahweh because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. Verse 18. Who is a God like you? who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. Isn't that a great phrase? Unchanging love. There's a song like that, isn't there? Unfailing love, yeah. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, he will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham. For you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. I love that. Just love that. He's saying, you know, Mike is saying, don't trust in anybody other than Yahweh. You know, you know, Obviously, you can take that to an extreme. We trust each other to a certain degree. I mean, I, you know, I, we, I, we trust the people that are in our lives. But ultimate trust belongs to only one. The one who knows us inside and out and who has compassion and the ability to alleviate and to direct our lives. Trust it all to him. And his love is unchanging. 
He does not change. I am the Lord thy, I am the Lord God, I change not. We change, He don't. And when you go off on your little escapade and you get in all the trouble that you get in, when you decide to stop the nonsense and turn around, you'll find a God that has not changed. He's still compassionate. He's still gracious. He's still long-suffering. He still is abounding in loving kindness and truth. And He will forgive you and He will work with you. He's incredible, the tolerance that He has for people like you. <laughs> That's not right, is it? For people like me. <laughs> Unbelievable. He's so good. In Second Chronicles 16, I'm not going to go there with you, but it says the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the earth for those that He can bless. Because He's a compassionate God. But He's not an intrusive God. He's not a bully. He's not a control freak. He's not going to make you. Uh, you can pray for God to take control of you all you want, but He's not going to do it. He will assist you. He will help you. He will give you. He will work with you. But you've got to surrender and allow Him in your life. And, and what a wonderful situation because He's so compassionate. And Jesus was the same way. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, that's the thing that we so love about our Lord. We see, we see God in operation through Him. We see that a man can be God-like and have the same kind of compassion that our God has because Jesus, everywhere He went, demonstrated the compassion of God in his life. All of, the, all of the healings and the love and the everything that he did oozed of compassion. In Matthew chapter 9, in verse 10 it says, Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, What's your teacher eating with the tax collectors in the kitchen for? Weenies. Can you imagine having the audacity to criticize Jesus? You talk about missing the mark. <laughs> and I, I, you got to love Jesus' response. And when Jesus heard this, he said, You morons, get out of my face. No, that's what, that's what John McCabe said. That's not what Jesus said. And when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy that need a physician, but those who are sick. In other words, who would you have me to hang out with? He hangs out with people like me that have need, that are wanting, that come, you know, that understand how badly I need his help. I'm afraid to put my pants on without his help. For, you know, I, you know we need him. That's who he came for those who understand the need. He hung around with the sinners and the tax collectors. This, to me, was an invitation when I read this. I can fit in here. You know, there's room for me because I am weak and failing and a sinner and needing of help. The Pharisees couldn't fit in there because they thought they had it all together. They thought they had it together, together enough that they criticized the Son of God. You imagine thinking, how wrong a way of thinking, how prideful. If you want the loving compassion of the God that we serve in your life, you have to allow Him in with humility. And Jesus knew that. He knew that the tax collectors and the sinners would be more prone to being receptive to the goodness of God than those who thought they had it all together. You know, our, our weakness can be our greatest strength if it leads us to Him. And then Jesus says to them, and um, Jesus heard this and He said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He tells the religious leaders to go back into the Old Testament and see what it says when it says, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I'm not looking for religion. I'm looking for people with heart. 
I'm looking for people who are like me, who can have a sympathetic consciousness of the distresses of other people and the desire to alleviate it. That's what Jesus was all about, and that's what Jesus' disciples are supposed to be all about. Not people who see other people's weaknesses and feel good about themselves that it's not theirs, or feel superior, and at least I'm not that screwed up. You know, rather, where they see like God sees a heart of compassion, and when they see like Jesus sees a great heart of compassion. And of course, uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, it talks about Jesus having ascended into heaven. And well, why don't we look at it? Hebrews chapter 2, all the way at the other end of your Bible, at the back of the Bible, before Revelation. Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, John was sharing on this just yesterday with us. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 17. Therefore he made, he, he, therefore he had to be made like his brother in talking about Jesus. In all things, therefore he had to be made like his brother in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for our sins. Jesus is a merciful, compassionate, merciful, faithful high priest. Verse 18, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. You know, I think a lot of people go through this thing. I, I've, I've certainly, have, in counseling with people or witnessing to people, you know, they, I say to them, well, why don't you come to fellowship? Why don't you come to church? He says, well, let me get it together first, and then I'll come. You know, I, I just don't feel like it, I, I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't feel right there. I mean, you know, I'd be with all these other people, and then I'd be, you know, I'm kind of dirty. So you haven't been to my church? <laughs> no, uh... uh <laughs> <laughs> that's a deception. It's just a flat-out deception. You know, well, let me get it together and then I'll come to church. That's not the way it works. You come and then you get it together. You know, you allow God to work in your heart. I mean, who are we, who are we, who are we tricking here? You know, I mean, God knows us from the very breath of the first. He knew us before we were, Right? That's what he said when we were in the dust of the ground. Before our mommy and daddy came together, he knew us. So we're going to trick him now. <laughs> That's sort of silly. And, and Jesus, who's at his right hand, is a merciful and you know, compassionate, caring high priest. He's ever there to help us in our time of temptation. He went through the temptations. And then chapter 4. In um, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for he hath, for we have, we, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that wonderful? And then I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. It says, in, it says in the Sermon of the Mount, the Beatitudes, it says, Be ye merciful. How does it, what does it say? In Matthew 5.5. 5, Be merciful as your Father is mercy. Show mercy. Be merciful. In other words, you could say, be compassionate uh, as your Father is compassionate. If you want mercy, show mercy, give mercy. And then in Luke 6, I thought I, could, I, thought I had these in my mind. They don't. Look at Luke 6, 32. Luke 6, 32. Oh, yeah, this one here. If you love those who love you, right, what credit is that to you? Even the sinners love those who love them. 
If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High God. For he himself is kind and grateful to the evil man. Be merciful, just like your father is merciful. After that description there about not, not, not being in a reciprocal relationship of love with people. Everybody does that. Everybody can figure that out. Everybody can bond in that regard. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Instead, he after that, he follows, now be merciful like your father is merciful. I mean, God is not looking for a return, and nor should we. But the point I wanted to make is, I've just spent this time explaining to you how merciful our God is and how compassionate it is. And again, that compassion meaning that he has this sympathetic consciousness of your distresses and the desire to alleviate them. He certainly has the ability to alleviate them. But if the desire becomes a manifestation, it's determined by our allowing him into our lives to utilize the compassion that he has to bring deliverance to our situation. And then we see that Jesus is the same way. He was the same way. And he continues to be a merciful high priest at the right hand of God. And we can approach the throne with great confidence because of that. And now he says to us, you be that way too. You be compassionate. And it says in in Colossians that you should be filled, a heart filled with compassionate. Be merciful like your father is merciful. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking in the ability to be merciful or to be compassionate like my God in that I wasn't there when you were born. You know, I didn't know you before you were formed, and I haven't been with you every day of your life, and I don't know what's in your heart and your life. So I'm not not as capable of doing it as he is. And I'm certainly not close to being where Jesus was so that I could have the same kind of compassion. This is the stuff that I can tell myself so that I don't have to have compassion. But the fact is, I have God in Christ in me with the Holy Spirit. All I got to do is ask them to make me compassionate. You know, I'm just like you. I'm self-centered. My feeling for you is that you should feel for me. You know, (laughs) why don't you understand me? (laughs) You know, and that's that human perspective. How am I going to get this merciful, compassionate attitude towards my fellow man? It comes with the Spirit. It's an enablement that God gives us. And, and, uh, and that we should feel what other people feel. We should understand the stone that's in the other man's shoe instead of criticizing the limp. We should, we should feel as he feels and he will empower. If you have the desire to do it, he'll empower you to do it. And then you'll start to see and have the same kind of heart and compassion that our Lord Jesus Christ has and God our Father has. And then life has a whole different perspective to it. Heavenly Father, help us to be compassionate like you.